Welcome to the 2013 Denver School Board Debates, presented by A Plus Denver. This November, voters will make important decisions that will impact kids for the next four years. Hear directly from the candidates about their plans to elevate education on the public agenda. School Board Debates presented by A Plus Denver. Along with partners Ed News Colorado and Fox 31, we thank you for joining us tonight as we talk to the three candidates vying for the district's at-large seat that is up this time around. And those three candidates are here with us tonight, Barbara O'Brien, Mike Kiley, and Joan Poston. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, for those of you who don't know, A Plus Denver is an advocacy organization with a mission to harness the power of Denver's civic leadership to build public will and advocate for those changes necessary to dramatically increase student achievement in Denver classrooms. We're going to start with the three candidates and their broad vision for the district. We're going to take about 10 minutes on this section here. And so we, we sort of drew numbers to decide who goes first. So Barbara, you're going to go first. Um, but talk a little bit about uh, your vision for the district and how you would accelerate change in DPS. Right now, only about half of the eighth graders are reading at grade level. The longer they stay in the system, the more likely they seem to fall behind. Could you take a couple minutes uh, and describe what you would do to accelerate achievement uh, in DPS or in some cases change the direction to accelerate achievement? Thank you. I'm happy to. That's one of the exciting things about getting to run for the school board, the chance to change lives by accelerating the way all of our kids are learning. So thank you for that. I've spent my whole career working on improving the public education system. And I think we all know in Denver that we love our schools. And we know that this is the, the door to opportunity in the future for all of our kids. And it's painful for everyone to know that not as many are getting the education we think they deserve. But we do know a lot how to get a lot of kids learning faster and progressing through the system. And it starts with a great foundation in early education. So I have worked and I will continue to work on making sure that all of the little kids in Denver get a good start with early education and that we push that up through elementary school. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about making sure kids learn how to read. I learned to read sitting on my grandma's lap talking to a mom who was very sick for a very long time. And it saved all of us in a way. And I just, I just want to spend my time making sure that every kid in Denver, every child, has the world open up to them through books and knowledge and reading. So pushing what we know works in elementary education up into middle school and high school we also know that kids need to understand that what they're experiencing in school has a connection to their dreams and they can think about a future and it's based on the fundamentals in the earlier grades. So I will work on a couple of things. One is closing the achievement gap so that more kids are on grade level all the way through school. The second one will be putting a laser focus on making sure that all third graders are reading by the end of third grade because that is the foundation of all learning that comes later. And third, um, we have to protect funding for enriched curricula in all of our schools. Kids absolutely have to be exposed to the arts and music. They have to study history. They need to study the things will let them understand their place in the world and the opportunities the world will hold for them. So that's my driving passion and why I'm running for the at-large seat. Barbara, thank you. Um, Joan in a couple of minutes, uh, outline your vision for the district. Well, my vision for the district is to develop. I think we have a very good foundation and we've gone and done lots of things with the preschoolers and lots of things with the elementary kids. And it just seems that we lose people. The older they get, the more they get lost. And when you get to the high schools in um, DPS is when your gaps really begin to show. I think this has to do with the fact that um, there isn't a diversity and a cultural piece there and that, that there are kids that are needing to be at home and helping with younger kids and doing kinds of um, things that social and economic situations create some real economic gaps and I'm not sure how we can get that portion of it, but I do know that we need some more tie-ins and buy-ins 
with our um, middle school and high school students. I would like to see all of the high schools accelerate. Um, we have a few really great high schools. We have high schools that do different kinds of things. And then I think one of the sad things that has happened lately is DPS has gone in and kind of thrown bombshells into some of the neighborhood um, high schools. Um, I think Montbello's really very sad about what has happened with their high school. Thank you. Uh, Mike, in a couple of minutes. So I think uh, in, in my experience, uh, I spent a lot of time in schools and what I've seen most effective uh, in, in dramatically improving performance is the right leadership. Uh, I think when we get the right uh, principal, uh, they, they're effective in, in pulling the community into the school, pulling the parents into the school. They're also very effective at attracting and mentoring and retaining talented teachers. Uh, so once you have those leaders, then you need resources. And I think uh, one of my focuses, uh, if I'm fortunate to be on the board, is to really scrutinize how the resources are being used at the administration level to make sure the schools have uh, the resources for proven technology and proven programs. And I think third is you've got to find the magic uh, extracurricular that engages kids, especially kids who are at risk. Uh, what I've seen in middle schools and high schools is that they have a tendency once they realize that they are falling behind that they just they check out and so you've got to find is it debate club is it a sport athletics music arts what is it that we can use to engage them uh, and again the offering those programs in every neighborhood I think gives us the best chance uh, so that we can close that achievement gap and improve proficiency uh, but yes, no question for you, kind of a follow-up here. Um, do you support the Denver plan in its current form, yes or no? No. 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 Okay, you just said no. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, explain what you change. Um, it needs to be drastically updated and the board needs to come up with new, more ambitious goals and very concrete strategies for getting there. I think it was okay five years ago, but it's out of date. Mike. I think it was flawed from the start. Uh, my recollection is that uh, enrollment was a major goal of the, of the Denver plan and, and I don't think uh, getting, uh, step one is getting the kids in, but that's not raising the bar high enough in my opinion. I think also um, our current uh, approach here uh, de-emphasizes a focus on proficiency. The conversations have to be about proficiency. Joan. Um. I'm a beekeeper, and um, I have been having to work with a hive that has been honey-bound this past um, couple of weeks, and I don't like working on a hive that's this late of the season, and I feel like the Denver plan came along too late, too many queen bees, um, there was uh, too much going on and not enough uh, restrictions so that you could have like areas where things are happening and areas where things are being supported. Um, the Denver plan doesn't evaluate what's happening and support what's working. Is the goal of the Denver plan the three and a half percent achievement increases in reading and math? Or, is that the right goal? They haven't been getting there, but is that the right goal or no? No, it'll never close the achievement gap. We're having trouble even meeting that goal, so having an even um, higher goal is going to be really tough, but that's why I think the plan has to be rewritten because we have to figure out how to hit very ambitious goals in a much more rapid way. So I think we have to be honest, and, and it, it, with any plan, you have to be willing to hold uh, every level of management, teachers, principals, everyone accountable. And I think, frankly, one of the flaws of the Denver plan is there's been no consequence for not hitting the goals. Joe? Um, I think that it's a little unrealistic to set these levels because you have different schools and different groups of people working at different levels. And if you have a, a school like down in Southeast Denver, where I'm from, that is at a 85% proficiency at third grade, and you say, every year we've got to go another 3.5% or we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, and it's like, I'm sorry, they're, they're, you can't keep pushing, pushing, pushing. You need to recognize where the people that are on the borderline, the people that are need to have the support to get to the 85, but you can't keep 
the pressure on, especially on the teachers. I want to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about school financing. Uh, the school board is responsible for managing the district's budget. As you know, in uh, 2012 to 2013, the approximate budget for DPS was $711 million. Uh, Marguerite Rosa describes the importance of district financial management in this quote. How you deploy public funds is your strategy as a district. So how would you, as part of the board, uh, redeploy funds to close the achievement gaps that we're talking about here? Don't all start at once. <laughs> well, I, I'll jump in okay. mainly because I want to first thank Mike. Um, I agree completely that leadership is important, and that happens to be my job training leaders for schools in low income neighborhoods. So, no matter what happens in the election, let's work on leadership together. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Thank you. What, um, I mean, how would you redeploy the funds, though? Does anybody have anything that jumps out at you? I mean, in terms of where are the resources right now miss? Allocated? I think they are. Yeah. I, we've got 2,600 district staff supporting somewhere between four and 5,000 teachers. I th I've worked in the private sector all my adult life, and I can tell you that ratio is, um, there's something wrong with that ratio. So I think we need a whole nother level of scrutiny. I think we need to work backwards from the schools. What do the schools need in terms of programs, in terms of teachers? What are we hearing from the principals, the, the, the resources they're struggling to get? Uh, I'm on, on a, a committee at North High School where we review the budget every year, the co a collaborative school committee, and, and I see the gaps the, in how the principals struggle to get their resource. So I think we need to budget backwards from the classroom and the school and then see what, where, what cuts can we make in, in the administration. But I think working with a budget means that you really deal with the numbers that are in front of you and not make them up to make a political point. There are 700 administrators in DPS out of a total of 15,000 employees. So there are 2,600 most, district staff. Most of the, 700 of them most are Most of the people who come in that number drive buses. They serve food. They're safety workers and security officers in schools. So if you want to cut that down, you have to tell us what you're going to cut. The people who feed the children, the ones who keep them safe, the ones who drive the buses. I just think it's important to be accurate about how you count this. I think I've been very accurate. There are 2,600 district staff. I think there are some really interesting uses of resources that don't have anything to do with staff. Um, they are have a bus system in Northeast Denver. They don't have the bus system in Southeast Denver. Southeast, I mean, Southwest Denver. Southwest Denver says, um, where is our um, success express, express for success? I can't remember. Anyway, it's you're, a bus. You're close. I know, I'm close. The truth is, is that <laughs> I, I think that with all of that, then they bring in a, a, a bus system to swipe your card so that they know you're on the bus. And I was like, wow, it, has this just changed since I was a kid and a bus driver doesn't recognize kids anymore? Is this, why are we spending this million dollars on a swipe system for a bus system that only a certain portion of the city gets? You yeah. know, it, there's, there's just so many other places where you can look at the resources and say, why is this being applied here? And, and and, and sometimes, this is a terrible thing to say, but sometimes I think it has to do with the business of education. We are here with a fancy new curriculum and we're gonna get everybody to do this curriculum and we're gonna train everybody to do this curriculum and we're gonna abandon it in three years. Can I touch on something around yep. busing? So I think what we're doing is we're finding a solution which creates another problem. I think uh, the reason why we have an increase in buses is because we, can't, we have failed to provide a quality option in every neighborhood. So now we're providing buses. So now we're mixing six-year-olds with 17-year-olds as they, as they share the same bus, which then means we now need to have certain security and protection for those kids as they each get on the bus going to different schools. The, the bus driver has no relationship with the kids because there's so many kids coming and going. So we create that next problem, and we're not listening to what the community wants, which is fix the neighborhood school. Give me a quality option close to home. Yeah. So I'll get us back on track. Okay. We were talking about the budget, and I agree the bus cards, it's a pilot. Who knows if it's going to work very well or not? I agree. I'm not quite sure what problem they're trying to solve. 
but when you take a look at where you're going to reallocate items in the budget, I think the, um, there's always places where you can find savings. But I think the important thing is that somehow we all campaign really hard for Amendment 66 while we're running for our own offices. Because if we're able to pass that, I think Denver's going to get an extra $1,500 per student going directly to the classroom with oversight and transparency and all the good things that can ensure the money's going where it's supposed to. So while we figure out where to put priorities in a budget, if Amendment 66 does not pass, we're going to be making deep, deep cuts in things we all believe in and not just making strategic cuts to reallocate toward priorities. So I think it's important to understand our full responsibility for the future of the district as well as right now. I, You're can't, your I head cannot, though. cannot get behind Amendment 66. Amendment 66 takes and raises the money and reallocates it to being put out by the state. And in the past, we've raised these monies, these mill levies and, and stuff, and we've done it with district um, supervision. And now we're going to take this and we're going to make it a state supervision. And the state is going to determine who is the neediest people and who needs what. And I'm like, that's just another level away from the neighborhood. I think you have to be neighborhood, and then the district, and then maybe the state. But Joan, the majority of the Denver budget is coming from the state right now. So it doesn't change the fact that we are already getting the most money for our schools that way. We're not responsible for funding our own schools. And this will help us create priorities around all the things we agree on, English language learning, the arts, tutoring. I, so I just have a hard time because right now the state is facing a really difficult situation with the flooding. Governor Hinkenlooper is taking all of the funds that he has, all of the funds that he saved for a rainy day, and he's putting them all into highways. I just don't see right now that that's going to be where things need to be in education from a state perspective is going to be helpful. Mike, can I just, before we, t uh, we're going to move on, but since we're on Amendment 66, your thoughts on that? So I, I do support it. I think it does make some important structural changes. I think early childhood education is very important. Um, I think uh, uh, what, what we have to be careful about here is, you know, we've got four of seven board seats open, this school board race, and the money is going to come to the school board. So uh, we have to trust that the school board is really going to scrutinize how the money is spent. Uh, starting from the administration on down and make sure that th those dollars get to the classroom. But I do believe uh, 66 does need to pass and I think it will be a, a positive for Denver. Now that's what's on the ballot this November. I want to go backwards a little bit to the last election cycle sure. and ask you each if you supported the most recent uh, bond and mill levy for the district. Yes or no? Yes, I supported both of them. Mike? I supported the mill levy and I opposed the, the bond because I I had serious concerns about how the funds would be spent. So the mill levy I was proud to campaign for and I'm very glad it passed. The bond, however, my concerns were that there were very vague categories of spending and uh, after it passed my worst fears were realized. Uh, the administration bought a new administration building uh, which cost $43 million and only $25 million is invested in school safety and cooling. Uh, and it leaves the majority of our classrooms not cooled. So, uh, you know, I think what we really need to talk about here is as a, as do we have the right board to really scrutinize how the dollars are used? I don't think the taxpayers intend to give us a blank check. They expect us to use those dollars extremely wisely. Uh, and I really think that's something I can bring to the board. I'm not going to rubber stamp a purchase uh, because I, uh, a certain political power base wants me to, I'm going to do what's right for my constituents, the community. Are there things that might come out of that bond, though, that could be positives at the end of the day? A high school in Stapleton, I've heard you that you support a high school like that. Absolutely. That, from what I'm told, wouldn't happen without the bond. Are there some positives that may come out of this bond? You know, and that's what's so unfortunate about this process. The, the way the bond was assembled was, was not in an honest and tra transparent way. But how about way. all these new seats for early childhood education, which we all agree so are important? Early childhood education was funded by the mill levy, which well, I did support. The, the buildings so they could have more kids in classrooms came through the bond. And so I'd say a good two-thirds of the bond was, was well, well structured. 
But there was a very vague $70 million category, if you go back and look at the bond, uh, the details of the bond, that the board voted on. And the board was not told what that $70 million was going to be used for, and it turned out a good portion of it was for a new building. So I think, I think this is what leadership is supposed to be. You have to look at a situation and say, look, we all want to do right by kids, but you're not being authentic in how, in how this information is being presented. And it's unfortunate that that data came out too late to correct the deficiencies in the bond so that we could have had a better bond on the ballot in, in 2012. Now, the, the folks that agreed with me and opposed the bond, we thought you know, we were going to fix it and get it on the ballot this year, of course, uh, not knowing that 66 was coming. I want to hear from Barbara real quick on this because I know you supported both, correct? Right, yes. Tell us why. Um, because we are running on fumes in Denver Public Schools and we need better buildings, we need early childhood seats, we need security, we need heating and warming, mm -hmm. and we need the operating funds to be able we can um, supply arts and education and tutoring and all the things the students need to be learning. Um, I think it's really important to not um, create confusion about something that is actually fairly transparent. There is, uh, there are two oversight committees of more than 32 citizens appointed by the board of direct, uh, school board to oversee how this money is spent. When the plan to no, I'm get sorry, the, 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 get the, the administration I'm, I'm appointed sorry. those board I'm members. Sorry. The Who board are? majority ratified the, the members, but, but actually the superintendent picked the members. The new administration building is going to be paid for by the sale of three existing administration buildings that are sprinkled around the city. They're going to be consolidated in one place and there's going to be a savings of about $2 million a year in operating costs that are dedicated for going back into the classroom. So we can have our differences about bonds and mills. I personally think that you don't try and withhold $466 million in improvements in physical structure from our kids, especially in a tight budget time. Did you have something before we move on, Joan? Well, I I, I think that this is <laughs> goes back to how I feel about Amendment 66. There is, if you went um, in Septem on September 18th in the Denver Post, there was an entire page about what Amendment 66 is about, and we get this much of a blurb to vote on. People don't go and read that. Right now, people are looking at what's happening with the um, Health Care Act in the nationwide half the people didn't know what was coming down the pikes. They never looked, they never were informed, it wasn't transparent, and I think this is the same kind of thing that's happening with um, 66. If you look at some of the things that they're thinking about doing, and I've talked to people about this, and one of them said, well, it's because you have to appease this person, and you have to appease that group, and you have to, and, it, and therefore it becomes all kind of, and, and it's, 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 it's funding by having to appease everyone. And it was just one of those moments where I'm like, it's not good when you try to please everybody. Too many cooks, too many queen bees. The vast majority of voters voted for it. So I think that was a wonderful statement from Denver about the importance of our schools. Quick question for all of you here. Should uh, the district own and manage buildings and should all public schools have access to them? You wanna start? Doesn't the district already own the buildings? I'm not sure about the question. Should the, should all pub, should the district own and manage buildings, properties? Like should, or should they contract You mean contract like school buildings? Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't understand why, why you would. Well, and, and I would add that, that prior generations have entrusted us to take care of, of these beautiful institutions like Emily Griffith. You know, and, and we were very fortunate that certain community members intervened to prevent the administration from, from uh, possibly demolishing this building that we're in right now, which has an amazing history. You know, so I think our, our buildings and our, uh, and our open spaces, too, have been entrusted to us, and we're expected to, to make good use of them and take care of them and pass them on to future generations. And that's why I strongly opposed uh, disposing, uh, disposing of Emily Griffith uh, because I do s recognize its history and our obligation to protect it. I'm going to move to a different topic now, uh, accountability. Uh, Senate Bill 191 would end a practice called forced placement that places teachers in schools, most often schools 
with hard to serve populations. Uh, and they've placed them there against that school leader's wishes. Uh, the teachers union has threatened to sue DPS in the state if they enforce placement. Um, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, and, and your views on mutual consent where both the teacher and the principal uh, agree to the hire. I've been starting with you a lot, so I'm gonna start this one down with Joan. Well, um, I think there's a lot coming down the pike as far as evaluating teachers. Um, part of this bill, I, I believe, is why we're doing the LEAP um, evaluations on um, teachers. And I think if you, get, if you get good evaluations and you figure out what the problem is and you address the problem and you get the resources going, um, then you don't have to have forced placement because you have somebody working in a, in a, a, a efficient and um, good way. So it, it's one of those things where I'm sitting here going, it, you're creating problems <laughs> that, that it's just you haven't addressed the problem early enough. Um, in 2005, I went to speak in, to the Denver board for the first time, and it was about the heating at my daughter's um, school. And I went to the National Weather Service, and I got all the data to find out which was a hotter month. June or August and I worked really hard to make this piece of paper and I worked to make this presentation and I stood up and <laughs> the entire board looked at my paper put it down and just continued and I was like that is not something responsive and 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 it's one of the reasons why I'm here is because I went to the board and I was expecting a response and I didn't get it and that was years before we, we could have we had the problems with people threatening to sue because their children were fainting. And that's how this heat thing became such a big deal. But if they had listened in 2005, I think they could have addressed some of these issues before it got to be such a big thing. Okay, uh, Mike, uh, Barbara, um, forced placement, mutual consent. So I, I think they're both, they both have their challenges. So forced placement obviously is not in the best interest of kids uh, to have teachers handed around the district. Uh, mutual consent also creates its challenges and I think what we're trying to fix is something that's broken at a level above the teachers and the principals and that is we need to have an administration that's built top to bottom with ex with with superstars who were who were former principals and teachers in their own right they understand the job they understand what it takes to be effective and I think once we have those individuals then then we we can build leadership at schools where they know how to mentor uh, teachers. So it, it, do we need a process by which ultimately we, we counsel some f folks out of the teaching profession? Sure. But uh, what I'm hearing consistently from parents and from teachers is that the coaching is extremely inconsistent. That we have very few individuals in the administration that are strong, uh, that have a strong track record in being a, a leader in terms of a, of a principal or teacher. And, and I think that's the root cause here. We need, we need a different sort of administration. Barbara, talk about, well, I know you were there on the yeah. front lines of the 191 yeah. battle. Right. Um, talk about ending, ending this practice. You know, I, I think in an effort to really have accountability up and down the line in education, it's really important to have principals who are accountable, not only for the performance and learning of the children, but the performance of the teachers in the building and then the, te the principal needs to be held accountable. And if you're going to hold someone accountable, they have to have control over the people they hire and keep in their school and the schedule and the curriculum. So I really think that the principal is a linchpin in this. And it's absolutely critical that they have the training they need to do it well, that they know how to have a good evaluation system and coaching and support. But if they're gonna be responsible and held accountable for their school, they have to be able to hire the people they think can help deliver the mission of the school. Um, school closures, very contentious, very controversial. Um, and that's an issue that sometimes board members have to confront. 60% um, of the students at Montbello High graduated in 2011, despite not very great resources um, or supports. 2010, uh, the school board voted to phase out the school old, old Montbello replace it with a couple of different schools within the school. We already mentioned that tonight. Um, still probably hotly debated out in the far northeast. I want to ask you each, under what circumstances do you support 
shutting down a school. And as a secondary follow-up, do you believe the Montbello model, the new plan, is working? Joan, I'll start with you. I, I have spoken to many community <coughs> members uh, about their, how they feel about this, and, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because what makes a successful school and how do you repeat a successful school? How do you get an East High School to be um, a TJ? Or how do, you, how do you move those kinds of um, success stories to another s place? Um, I feel very sorry for Montbello because I think they kind of were told that the previous model wasn't working and we're going to come in and we're going to put this other model in and, and we know um, because they've done studies in Harvard and we've done it, it, that things should go this way and, and there are people who are making these studies and decisions that aren't on the ground level and aren't a part of the neighborhood and don't understand the history. So it sounds like you think it was a bit misguided, not sure it's working. Mike? Yeah, so I, I have deep concerns about how Montbello played out. I, I think it was pretty clear that decisions were made and then taken to the community to be sold. And I think that's the, the heart of the challenge we currently have with the school board is, is there are other interests involved for each of the members. And, and I think the challenge here is that we've got to have a board that works exclusively for the community that has no other extraneous connections. And, you know, in the case of, of uh, Mrs. O'Brien, uh, DPS has paid her organization over a quarter million dollars over the last three years. And, uh, ed and for services both in terms of, of educating principals but also putting consultants in schools. So now if, if Mrs. O'Brien's on the board, she now has an interest in every school in which she has a consultant. That's the nature of consulting. You're an advocate for your customer, in this case the school. So now if she's voting for a given school, and, and a neighborhood, a school in that same neighborhood comes up, there's an inherent conflict of interest there. She's got a financial interest in what happens to one school, and, and the community has got an interest in the neighborhood school, and I think that's a conflict. And, and I have, I'm very concerned uh, that, that uh, and Barbara O'Brien's not alone in this, there are other members who also have, have similar connections and, and conflicts of interest. And I think what, what, you know, we can debate the legality of that or what the rules are. I think the problem is that the board needs to answer only to the community, to start first with the community. Well, and I, I think- make sure Barbara just has time to respond to that. I don't okay. mean to cut you sure. off, but- yeah, understood. Uh, so I just want to give you a moment to respond to what he said and also to yeah. talk a little bit about the far northeast. Yeah. So school closures have been awful and some of them have been good. They are really hard to do. It, they're very upsetting for the adults in the community. But I do think that the, the focus of the board needs to be on the students. And to accept students being failing in failing schools generation after generation is absolutely unacceptable. Do we have a perfect solution for how we deal with those schools? We're far from it but we have to keep searching for ways to make sure that generation after generation doesn't go through a school that is absolutely failing. And as to Get Smart Schools, um, a little marketing for my nonprofit, if you don't mind, um, I think it's a mistake to think that every person who's on an elected board should have absolutely no real world experience. I mean, if we're electing people who have never tried to do the work or never tried to be involved in creating change, then you end up like, a lot of our legislature who have very little real world experience. So the money that comes to get smart schools, I'm very happy to say because I do think Denver educators should be paid more than they are, goes out to stipends to them to help cover the costs of their training. So I'm very happy that we are a pass through for the very people we think deserve more support so they can get the training they need to be more effective. So will you resign though if you win the school board race will you resign from Get Smart Schools? No I talked to the D DPS lawyer he said he thought maybe there would be one percent of dis decisions so, that came But that doesn't this. make sense to me because you you work with with uh, with what I think in the history of Get Smart Schools you've worked with 80 different schools uh, no, so that no. uh, it's quite a well, it's 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 in the tens at least, and we've, we've had and the second problem we've had I have with that people go through our program. Okay, so but the second problem I have with that is is the DPS lawyer will work for you uh, if you're on the board. So I I wouldn't view that to be a disinterested third party. 
you know. But again, I think that the underlying to your your premise, I agree. Uh, I think a school board member needs to show a history of being active in the community, and and achieving results. And and I'm very proud of the work that I did at Skinner Middle School. Uh, but I think the distinction here is that I don't run in a in a certain political circle. I don't run in in in, in a powerful uh, political machine. I'm focused on the community, I'm talking to the parents, I'm hearing what the teachers say, and we're forging partnerships at the grassroots level to make a big difference. I'm very proud of what Skinner has done. Uh, its enrollment will double by within a couple years. It's on green, and it was on the, it was on the verge of being closed at, back in 2009. And the difference was the community and the leadership at the school working together and forcing uh, the administration to give us the, uh, the resources we needed. I think it's wonderful we have parents like Mr. Kiley who work very hard on his own children's school. I've spent 25 years creating Excuse preschool me, no, for no, kids. No, I worked on Skinner before my K, kids were which there. Which is brand new standards for the whole education system. Ascent, which lets high school students also get an AA degree from community college at the same time they're going to high school. Health care for uninsured kids. So I am very proud of my track record. Yes. Yeah, so just so you know, though, my, I worked on Skinner before my kids were eight. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. I, Not we, a problem. we do have to move on. Not um, a problem. Our time is is moving quick. Uh, the next topic is school choice, um, and I know you have strong feelings about this as well. There are charters like DSST and Strive that are getting great results. They have long waiting lists. Um, should the district encourage the replication of these kinds of schools, uh, Denver School of the Arts, uh, other magnet schools? They have long waiting lists. Should they be replicated, Barbara? Yes, we ought to have more of things that are working, absolutely. And I think we need to get away from these legal um, vocabulary debates over whether something is innovation, magnet, or charter. I think we ought to look at everything that's working well, whether it's a neighborhood school or something else, and do more of that and do less of the things that are leading to schools that are not succeeding. Mike. So I, I believe in choice. I believe any uh, change to a school, though, has to start with the community. It has to be their idea, you know, and I feel very strongly about that. So I think the extreme uh, example of choice, though, is vouchers. And, and so uh, uh, if you've seen before, Mrs. O'Brien and I have had past disagreements about vouchers. I read the paper. Uh, back in uh, last Tuesday, she... The positive one about me? I read everything, don't you worry. <laughs> so I, I did some reading, too. And uh, I found a Denver Post article back in 2003 regarding the voucher program, and it was very troubling to me. Uh, the DPS was forced to accept that 69 private and religious schools were going to uh, receive public dollars. And some of the applicants for these dollars included schools that banned homosexuality, that banned dance, that banned dating. And, and so I guess my question is, is do you regret supporting vouchers hearing that, that it attracted these types of extreme schools uh, trying to get public dollars? So the children's campaign's mission is to look out for the most vulnerable children in society. And we always search for solutions to kids that were failing and struggling. And I'm proud of the fact that we never stopped looking for ways to let the most vulnerable get a shot at the kind of education you and I fight for for our kids. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't really No, I hear. totally oppose vouchers, and I don't think it's an issue that the Denver School Board will conceivably be dealing with, and I would not support it either. Well, the board back in 2003 couldn't believe they were dealing with it then, uh, oh, and they were forced to deal with it. Yes, but we had several board members change their mind and say they thought it would be an interesting pilot program to try out, and I'm happy to say that we don't even need it anymore. So Den 69 Denver, schools, though, doesn't sound like a pilot Denver to has become a school district of choice, and there are so many options for kids, and they can find, their parents can find schools that match their needs, and I think we double down on alternatives and choices so every child can have a good school right now for what they need. Joan, I just want to bring you in here and, and your thoughts on, okay, on choice well, and replicating um, these different I kinds of I spent um, six years on the Denver District School Accountability Committee, and that committee was actually legislated to review all of the um, charter schools and how they um, were um, um, producing um, and, and what they were about. And during my 
my um, tenure there on the board, I had to help um, decide to close one of the um, uh, charter schools, and that wasn't an easy thing when we talk about school closures. Um, I think that, that there is a place for charter schools, but I think that there is an accountability piece that needs to be there. And I think the one thing that disturbs me most is that they don't have some of the resources that they need for special education and for other kinds of things, and so they kind of steer children away from them. Mike touched on this. This is not a question about vouchers, but this is just a question about taxpayer dollars going to private schools. Uh, if those schools have the same accountability measures, should DPS dollars go and, and fund kids at other kinds of schools, real quick? Um, they do right now. That's how DPS pr gets a lot of special education services. It contracts with Escuela at Plata Loco. So it's doing that right now. Mike? Uh, Escuela is a great, a great example of that. My, I think Escuela, though, came from the community. Corky Gonzalez founded that school, and it was the community's idea. So the question is, is this being imposed from the top down? or was it the community's choice to, to create that school? I think that there are places for exceptions, but on the whole, I think that the dollars should be going to the neighborhood schools. I think they should be supporting what has worked, and um, there are exceptions to every rule, and I think that it's important that we s see those and make places for those, because the truth of the matter is, is never, not every child can fit into a category. So. Not every school can fit into a category, and I guess that's the nice thing about DPS with their school of choices right now, is that they do have a place where somebody who doesn't fit into the main category can go. In terms of co-location, say a school is half empty, should they use that space, bring in another school, a different kind of school, a school within a school, uh, to give that community a different kind of option in terms of not just a one-size-fits-all uh, experience? So this is something that um, has not been handled very well in a lot of instances in DPS. I've seen co-location in other places in the country where it actually the amount of collaboration and communication led to a successful co-location. I think what happened at North was a very bad example. So agreeing with Joan, it's how you do it. It's the implementation. I think one of the more interesting things about being on the Denver District School Accountability Committee is that we had these um, charters come in and they were giving us applications and we were looking at these applications and we were sitting there going where is this going to be happening where is this going to be happening and the administration had already decided where they were going to try and stuff these people and that's not how you want to do something you want to have community buy-in you want to have to start a charter you really should be going to the community where you want to have it and have the people say, yes, I will support this. Or heaven forbid it was the community's idea to begin with every now and then. Mike, just generally, co-location, you're open to it? I, 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 if the building is not designed for it, I have inherent concern about it. And I hear this from parents with, with kids that are going to lunch at 10.30 in the morning and at 1.30 in the afternoon. But in the end, if it's the community's idea to make it work, then I think it has a much better chance of success. Thank you. Um, we're going to move along, speed things up a little bit here, okay. and um, stop the sort of the engagement. It's, it's fun to watch, but I'm just going to talk <laughs> to each of you individually for a minute. Um, there was a recently published A-plus Denver candidate survey. Um, a lot of you answered most of those questions. There were a couple questions that were left blank, so I'm going to press you a little bit on some areas um, where maybe we didn't get um, a full answer or an answer. Um, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, I want you to just say whether or not you agree with the statement that, I, that I'm about to read. So just give me a yes or no. Yes, you agree. No, you disagree. Uh, all new schools, whether charter, innovation, or district, should be held uh, to the same standards for opening. I think I agree with that. Tenure under the old system, not uh, SB 191, but before that, uh, was too easy to obtain. I don't have enough data to answer that. I'm sorry. Uh, and, and last question, the district's literacy and math programs are effective? No. Disagree? Disagree. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara, a uh, couple uh, questions from the survey still. Um, same thing, agree or disagree with these statements. Uh, number one, charters should have equal access to district facilities. <coughs> Not equal. 
I think we need a community process. See, this is why he and I both didn't answer some of the questions, because they're complicated and they require some nuanced thinking, and I don't think either one of us wanted to We didn't to fill them out together, though. Yeah. We no, we didn't coordinate. <laughs> but I it, didn't write the question. No, it's but, Vance but, it, but it's for, no, it's for this very reason, because they are complicated issues and boiling it down to one answer, mm -hmm. I think, violated it the does. depth of thinking we're trying to put into Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to still come back with you for another agree or disagree question, but uh, tenure under the old system, not 191, was too easy to obtain. Correct. Uh, the district's literacy and math programs are effective. Math, yes. Literacy, no. Okay. Thank you. All right, Joan. Um, in the survey, you indicated that you don't think innovation schools should have control over budgets and staffing. Why? Um, I think that there's an accountability piece, and when you start saying, okay, um, we're going to let you run your own thing, you end up with things like um, the Stanley British um, School in, in having uh, the man, he's run off with the money, and he, he ran off with $340,000, and, and the school is saying, well, that isn't going to affect how our children are, are being handled here, and I'm like, so seriously, you can say goodbye to this kind of money and so I, I think it's a matter of oversight and, and I just don't think that that you, we should just give somebody a bunch of money and, and, and say you can handle this however you want to handle it and you don't have to be accountable. Um, th there's a union piece in there that's, that's kind of an interesting piece. Um, when I was a reading and writing specialist, I was a reading and writing specialist for DPS for five years. I, uh, I belonged to the union and I understood some of the pieces that go into it. Um, I just think that there is a, a accountability and, and I think that's one of the reasons I became a member of the Denver District School Accountability Committee is because I don't think there's been accountability. Uh. One other question. You also stated that we shouldn't have an ROI tool that shows spending at the school level and achievement gains. Why not? <sighs> this goes back to um, how I feel about um, connecting children directly to a teacher's output. Um, I have a child who, who is, is right in the middle of the curve. She's not above the curve, she's not below, she's right in the middle. And the sad thing about it is sometimes those kids do get lost. Um, the thing is, is that you can hold a, a teacher responsible for what's going on to a point, but there are other things that are happening in a child's life and you can't directly tie somebody's reading skills to something because I, as a reading and writing specialist, could get children to, to come up a year or two years, but I was working with them one-on-one, -on -one, and I was approaching them from a different approach, and I was a resource that, that that teacher had, and I didn't get accounted for that, but her, her evaluation is accounted for me working with this child. So it, it, it's just not, I, I just don't think it's a good thing. Uh, briefly, before we go to closing statements uh, on tenure, I asked you about that earlier. Um, how should it be awarded and when should it be taken away? I know it's a complex question. I'm going to ask you to keep yeah. your answer about 30 seconds or so. Well, I think we need to give the state law a chance to work and see if it works. And if it doesn't, we should go back and tweak it. But right now, you can earn tenure, but you don't keep it if your evaluations drop. So I think the focus has to be on how the kids are doing and all of the adult things have to be flexible to deal with the reality of what's closing the achievement gap and moving our, our students forward. Mike. So I, I think uh, uh, to build on what Barbara said, I think it comes down to uh, are, are the evaluations fair and effective? And are they being, uh, are they being conducted by experienced uh, staff that has, have done, that have been teachers before? And, and is it consistent, you know? And so I think that is what's so important here is that, is that we have an evaluation process that covers the things the teachers can control. This was piloted last year, right? A LEAP was? No, yes. the 191, that teacher evaluation. It was. Yes. What do, I mean, from what I understand, most of the teachers were rated effective. Do you, based on what you've seen from the pilot, does it look okay to you? Or? So uh, what I saw was 270 teachers that were uh, not hot rehired in a, in a medieval exercise, basically. 
Uh, and, and so I think the execution of it was very unprofessional. Do we have an opportunity to improve it? Absolutely. And Joan? I think it was a piece and an attempt at accountability, and I do believe that there should be accountability. Um, the one problem I have is, is that sometimes it's tied to like bubbling in on standard tests, and, and I don't think that that is exactly what I want my child to be learning. I would like a critical thinking piece. And I had somebody the other day say to me, well, so how do you evaluate this critical thinking piece? And I said, well, when the child is 27. And they all went, seriously? And I went, yeah, because children's minds develop in certain ways and certain things. And I can say right here that I can read because of Mrs. Smith in the third grade. Mrs. Smith doesn't remember me. Um, thank you all for your responses. I think we're going to move to uh, the closing statements. We're going to give you each approximately two minutes to uh, tell the folks watching uh, at home and online uh, about your vision for the district and why you're the best choice for the at-large seat. Uh, we came up with the order already, too. So, Mike, uh, you're going to go first with your closing statement. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Fox 31 and A Plus Colorado and uh, Eli you, uh, for the a masterful hosting here and coordinating. Uh, so, my name is Michael Kiley. I am, I am running at large for school board and. And what, the reason why I am the best candidate is because I have a proven track record for working with the community, for leading the community in a direction that shows results. I am accountable only to the community, but I will hold the administration and the principals and, and the community accountable for the results. Uh, I will engage parents. I will work with state and federal and local resources, nonprofits, churches, whatever it takes to get the right resources for our kids to succeed. I know they can because I, I'm a product of public schools and I believe in them passionately. I will defend them, I will never support vouchers, and I will never put myself in a situation where my interests are compromised. I will only serve you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Joan. Um, my name is Joan Poston, and I am running for uh, the Denver Board at Large. I decided to run on July 12th. I did that because I'd gone to uh, Dealey Plaza, and I realized that it had been 50 years since JFK had been shot. And I realized that there was something I could do for my country, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I don't have a manager, and I'm not taking any donations, and therefore I don't think I'm a very good politician. Uh, which I think is what this board needs, is I, I have been from both inside and the outside. I've been with DPS as a staff member. I've been with DPS as a parent. I've been with DPS as a com current concerned community member on a, an accountability board, and I sincerely believe that I will not have any kinds of strings any kind of, of private agenda or anything that would keep me from just being there and being there for the community and the kids. I am doing this to serve, and that's the only reason. Thank you. All right, Joan, thank you. Uh, and last, we'll go to Barbara O'Brien. I remember the people I've met along the way in 25 years of trying to improve the health and education of kids. I remember a mom who was crying because her 14-year-old son, she just found out, couldn't read, and somehow he had been passed along. And I remember the mom who was all smiles because she never graduated from high school, but her daughter was doing really well, and the school started an adult literacy program, and she and her daughter were doing homework together, and the mom was going to graduate about the same time as the daughter. And I remember the single father who told me he got home from work at 10 o'clock at night and his two little kids, not, one not so little, 12 and 8, would come home from school and the 12-year-old would make dinner for them. They would have peanut butter sandwiches most nights until the dad got home at 10. So when we talk about closing the achievement gap and creating opportunity and hope for these kids and these families, clearly it's more than just a reading program or whether or not we get the cooling systems fixed. We need to engage the entire community of Denver to wrap 
their arms around these people and give them the supports they need to have the kinds of lives they want and to help their children fulfill their dreams. And I've spent my entire career working to help make this happen. And if I'm elected, I will work that hard to keep going for Denver because our whole future depends on those kids getting a chance to fulfill their full potential. Thank you very much. You guys up for one last question, even though we just did closing statements because sure. we have a little bit of time left. Absolutely. <laughs> is it a lightning round one? No, it's not a lightning it's round a one. Close. This is just moderator's <laughs> license to, to mess with you. Um, oh, great. Just kidding. You've all been around education a long time. Um, what have you learned that you didn't know before this campaign started? Just give me, each of you, give me one thing that you didn't know about this district or just about education in general that you may have thought you knew or didn't know. Give me one thing uh, in 30 seconds or so uh, from each of you. I'll start. I went to the bank today and I told the young teller that I was running for school board and he said, mm, I come from a small town in Nebraska and we have to beat the bushes to get somebody to even, even try. And I'm sitting here looking at a school board that in 2011 they spent $600,000 the candidates to become a school board member and it's not even paid and I'm like that that is such dedication that is such passion and that is just a, an extremely interesting aspect of this Mike or Barbara we're the envy of the country I mean this is hard bless you you have to be working so hard to do this the way you are and yet you look around the country and they're saying, we can't believe your community cares so much about this and that the caliber of people are running who are running. And it makes you stop and say, yeah, it's a grind. We know what a grind it is right now. But it's so important. And other communities wish they had this kind of love of their public school system. And it keeps me going every day. Thank you. Mike? I think um, what, what I would say that the surprise to me is, is this whole charter pro against is, is a false debate. As I've gone around and talked to thousands of people, everyone wants a quality option in their neighborhood and they're so supportive of their neighborhood school that they're not promising their kids are going to go there, but they want to help. They want to make it work. There, there's no part of Denver that feels like it's, it's, um, it's a situation where all the schools do is just keep the kids safe. That's the best we can hope for. Uh, there is hope and, and optimism in, in every corner of Denver that I've visited. My thanks to all three of you for uh, being here tonight and for putting yourselves out there, obviously, to run for this. It is a, a great community service that our board does, and so uh, we appreciate you volunteering for it uh, and fighting for it and uh, treating us to a rather engaging and lively debate tonight. So thank you to thank all three you. of you, and best of luck. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much for watching another installment of the two, uh, 2013 A-plus Denver DPS School Board debates. Uh, there are two debates left. Uh, we did one last week. We have two more. The District 2 debate, that's a Southwest Denver seat. Uh, the debate for that will be Wednesday night, October 2nd. And then uh, a week after that, uh, the District 4 debate. That's Northeast Denver, the district that includes Montbello, the far northeast we call that. That is Wednesday, October 9th, and both of these, uh, like this debate here tonight, uh, start at 7 o'clock uh, right here on DPS TV, Channel 22, and they also stream live online at dpsk12.org slash channel 22, uh, if you can remember that. Uh, if you have questions you'd like to ask the candidates, you can also go to the A-plus Denver website. That's A-plus Denver, all written out. Dot org, or use the hashtag DPS Debates on Twitter or Facebook if people use, use hashtags on Facebook. I don't know, they might. Thank you very much for watching tonight, uh, and don't forget to vote on November the 5th. Good night. Welcome to the 2013 Denver School Board Debates, presented by A Plus Denver. This November, voters will make important decisions that will impact kids for the next four years. Hear directly from the candidates about their plans to elevate education on the public agenda.